I still don't know if I can control myself. I know you can. You have to tell me what you're thinking. I feel like you're gonna disappear. I don't know how long I've waited for you. This is not the kind of romantic we are going to talk about. The essence of romanticism is the ability to wonder and reflect. The American literary romanticism movement took place between the 1820s and 1860s and was inspired largely by a similar English movement from the previous generation. Like its English counterpart, American romanticism was in response to the empiricism and logic of the Enlightenment era, in which people believed that the world could be explained through rational calculation. Romantic authors also wrote in response to the urbanization, structure, and environmental side effects of the Industrial Revolution. American Romanticism was strongly characterized by intense emotions, creativity, imagination, and what is known as the sublime. In early American literature, these concepts were often applied to nature, the source of all wisdom and knowledge. Romantic authors viewed nature as the primary channel in which self-reflection and self-realization could take place. A person could achieve a greater understanding of the world around themselves by spending time in quiet contemplation. Romantic heroes were often common people who sought refuge from the constraints of society for the boundless sanctuary of nature. Some of the main players during this movement included Washington Irving, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson, and Herman Melville. For romanticists, there was something incredibly didactic about nature. Its beauty, its terror, and its wonder possessed for these authors a means of understanding both the world around them and themselves. For example, the narrator in William Cullen Bryant's To a Waterfowl, one of the earliest examples of American romantic poetry, does more than really describe the flight of a beautiful seabird, but also takes time to reflect on what this experience has taught him as the bird departs. Thou art gone, the abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form, yet on my heart deeply hath sunk the lesson thou hast given, and shall not soon depart. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. Washington Irving was the first major American writer who could make a living wholly on his writing. He is also a major figure in the development of the short story. His short story, Rip Van Winkle, deals with such romantic themes as the preference of the country to the city, while The Legend of Sleepy Hollow delves into the gothic and supernatural, hinting at an unseen world that dwells beyond mortal comprehension. Ichabod Crane, Ichabod, what a name, kind of odd, but nice just the same. Like other romantic authors of his day, Nathaniel Hawthorne centered his literary works around imaginative, emotional, and even terror themes, with the intent to impart some wisdom to his readers. Where Hawthorne seems to delineate from his peers is in the use of highly puritanical devices. Unlike other romantic authors who believed that man was inherently good, and that it was civilization that corrupted man. Hawthorne preached against man's natural tendency to sin, and many of his works explored the symbolism and deep psychological implications that accompanied mortal sin, guilt, and retribution. The Scarlet Letter, for example, is not only a cautionary tale, but it is also considered a gothic romantic novel in the sense that it contains several depictions of imposing landscapes and architecture. It further explores the dark recesses of the human mind in such a way that goes beyond rational explanation. This fascination with the fallibility of man, and man's proneness to sin and self-destruction, came to be known as Gothic or Dark Romanticism. Herman Melville, meanwhile, used his five years' experience at sea as inspiration for one of the most notable American Romantic novels in history, Moby Dick. Some of the major themes in this work include the destructive power of nature, the ambiguity behind good and evil, and the debate on the existence of God. Melville employs highly imaginative and Gothic descriptions of the sea, the enigmatic white whale, and even some of his human characters to create a menacing and even supernatural air about the story. Consider the nature imagery Melville uses when describing a scar on the face of his protagonist, Captain Nahab, a man who embodies the beautiful yet dangerous elements of the sublime. It resembled that perpendicular seam sometimes made in the straight, lofty trunk of a great tree when the upper lightning tearingly darts down it, and without wrenching a single twig, peels and grooves out the bark from top to bottom, ere running off into the soil, 
leaving the tree still greenly alive but branded. Destroyed. I think you've got Moby Dick, sir. Congratulations, Pequod. You've nuked a school of squid. Where there are squid, there are whales. Prepare to launch torpedoes. Like other romantic authors, Edgar Allan Poe placed a heavy emphasis on landscape and the intense emotions it produced in his works. However, Poe's gothic approach to romantic themes was meant to create a deeply disturbing impression upon his characters, attempting to connect readers with the sublime, a phenomenon whose beauty and grandeur is only matched by its potential for danger. For example, in The House of Usher, the narrator's first encounter with the landscape surrounding the melancholy house render him unable to explain his feelings rationally. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decaying trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveler upon opium. In essence, the feeling of coming down from a bad trip is much like the feel of gothic literature. It is said that in the 1830s, a group of young people in New England began a revolution. Unlike many, another revolution that had been and that would be. This one involved no physical weaponry. Instead, as a leading revolutionary, Ralph Waldo Emerson noted years later, the young men were born with knives in their brain, a tendency to introversion, self-dissection, and anatomizing of motives. Transcendentalism was an intellectual, semi-religious movement that emerged in New England at roughly the same period as Romanticism's heyday in American literature in the late 1820s and 30s. The basic idea of transcendentalism is the exploration of a naturalistic and unstructured spirituality. It is interesting to note, however, that both transcendentalism and Romanticism are built on the foundation of Puritanism, which pervasively touched every aspect of American life. Take, for example, these words from the Puritan Jonathan Edwards' personal narrative. God's excellency, his wisdom, his purity and love, seemed to appear in everything, in the sun, moon, and stars, in the clouds and blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, and all nature, which used greatly to fix my mind. It is striking to note Edwards' emerging focus on nature's reflection of the sublime, as would be seen in the American Romantic movement while his striving to express God and to understand his nature can also be seen as somewhat of a precursor to the Transcendentalist movement. In the book The Spirituality of American Transcendentalists, it is explained that the Transcendentalists were children of the Unitarians who emerged from the liberal wing of Puritanism. Even as they rebelled against their past, the Transcendentalists continued to embody these Puritan tendencies and qualities. Like their ancestors, too, they were haunted by their sense of morality and the moral law, and they thought of the task of spreading their new gospel as a vocation, a calling by God. The Transcendentalists preached with a confidence and an optimism that matched their ancestors' sense of intimacy with God. The first thing we have to say respecting what are called new views here in New England at the present time is that they are not new. But the very oldest of thoughts cast into the mold of these new times. What is popularly called Transcendentalism among us is idealism. Idealism as it appears in 1842. Transcendentalism was pioneered by the great essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson, whose spiritual journey as a Unitarian minister eventually brought him to the conclusion that institutionalized religion was a barrier to an individual's full union with God. We live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. We see the world piece by piece as the sun, the moon, the animal, the tree. But the whole of which these are the shining parts is the soul. After quitting his pastorship, Emerson turned to writing and publishing and published the groundbreaking essay, Nature, in 1836 establishing the basic beliefs of what would soon become Transcendentalism. In the following years, Emerson and other like-minded thinkers in Massachusetts formed a think tank called the Transcendental Club to discuss these ideas. 
Today's readers will find that at the core of Emerson's transcendentalism lies the concept of individualism. This concept finds itself a sort of manifesto in his essay Self-Reliance, where he argues for the need for the individual to not be a conformist and powerfully disclaims any who do not follow their own instincts and intuitions. Interestingly, the word individualism was not even coined at the time. As Tocqueville famously says in Democracy in America, individualism is a word recently coined to express a new idea. Our fathers only knew about egoism. It is important when understanding the transcendentalist movement to realize that the concept of individualism was an emerging and not well-established concept at the time. As modern readers, we look back at Emerson's words and connect perhaps too readily with the ideas of individualism we know today. Take, for example, Reebok's commercial UBU, which consists entirely of Emerson's transcendental doctrine. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. To be great is to be misunderstood. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion. Insist on yourself. Never imitate. God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. Discontent is the want of self-reliance. It is infirmity of will. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. Perhaps Emerson did not mean that by buying mass-produced image icons such as sneakers, we would be seizing our individualism. Or maybe he would buy a pair himself. We will let you decide. One of the more influential of Emerson's transcendentalist colleagues was Margaret Fuller who edited the, the Transcendental Club's literary journal, The Dial. Fuller managed to contribute both to literary criticism, exploring the definition of American literature, and to women's rights. Margaret Fuller is considered to be a founder of modern feminism. But what exactly did Transcendentalists believe? Rather than getting entangled in proving or disproving doctrine, Transcendentalists emphasized forming a close relationship with God and the universe by relying on the personal intuition rather than the external tuition. Emerson spoke feelingly on disregarding any external forces that ran against the grain of individual intu intuition, which he described as revelation for the present age. Compared to personal witness of divine truth, external mandates, proofs, and miracles were inferior evidences of religion. The Romanticist's fascination with nature was echoed by the transcendentalists, who respected nature as a place removed from the corrupting interference of human society. Transcendentalists believed God could be found everywhere, but that it was easier to connect with him in a natural setting. Hence the Rose retreat to Walden Pond, and hence also the formation of a utopian farming community outside Boston by several members of the Transcendental Club. Transcendentalism came down to spirituality instead of physicality, the idea of forming spiritual connections to your inner self, to God, and to the universe in order to transcend the mundane distractions of physical existence. These ideas informed the writings of authors for years to come. Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, for example, explored the poet's relationship with the broader universe, and Louisa May Alcott interacted from a younger age with the great minds of the Transcendental Club, of which her father was a member. With all the names flying around, you may want to know how to identify and distinguish transcendental and romantic writings, in case you ever forget exactly who's in what movement. The differences are clearest in context. Transcendentalists espouse a nebulous theology, and so their texts emphasize using inner spiritual experiences to approach the divine. They often relate personal experiences, usually in nature, to demonstrate the link between man, God, and the universe. In romantic writings, nature is less pure and more supernatural. It's colored by the sublime, not the divine. Romanticists tend to explore the psychological development of characters, who are usually sensitive, isolated individuals seeking what is beautiful or ideal. Romanticists are also inclined to use rhetorical flourishes. Both Romanticism and Transcendentalism represent the period's zeitgeist of searching out new meaning and questioning the established meaning of times past.